now we're going to be talking about something that we've been working on for the better part of two years, um, Active Countermeasures AI Hunter. And I have Paul on with me. Uh, Paul has been there from the beginning um, when we first started talking about this a long, long, long time ago. And I convinced him to quit Tenable and start doing his own thing and come help us out. And then Chris Brenton, is also on and Chris because Paul and I are crazy in a thousand different directions has really taken over and driven this thing and, and and gotten it through and without Chris it would not be here uh, but also on top of that we have amazing developers we have Ethan we have Melissa we have Joe we have Lisa we have Sam we have Hannah we have Ben LeBron um, I know I'm forgetting some people here and I apologize profusely for that but uh, oh, Lawrence would be in this category because he was there at the very beginning. So this has been a long, long time uh, to get it to the point where we have a product that we can show you guys today. Um, yes, it's finally done. Now, Paul, you had a couple of things that you wanted to talk about. Uh, do you want to talk about that now with AI Hunter? Or do you want yeah. me just to do the demo and talk about it? Go ahead. I, well, I'd love to because I'm so excited. So earlier today, uh, John and I were talking about the problem that we solve. Um, and, you know, Chris, John and I have been having this kind of ongoing uh, discussion in various capacities. And I I really think, well, first of all, I'm excited to get this in the hands of, uh, of our, our tribe, so to speak, so that we can get feedback and really try to understand. So what problems are we solving for you? Um, what did you like? What didn't you like? Uh, and I know Chris is very and John are both very passionate about that as well. If I think about it seemingly as an outsider looking in, not staring over your shoulder, uh, you know, every day as you do your work, uh, I really think the problem is we rely on too many unreliable sources of security data. Now, there's a lot of other issues and problems that we talk about in our workplace, but I think it all hinges on this pedestal of we're relying on way too many unreliable sources in order to make decisions in any given day. And I think that when we rely on these unreliable sources, um, it there's like three other problems that it brings about. Like we either don't have the right skill to be able to use this data to make intelligent decisions. We also run out of time and we're not able to parse through all of these different sources to get to the stuff that matters and we run out of time. And then it's the accuracy uh, of that information that's also problematic. And I think that's why you know, John and I and, and also Chris created what we've created is because we're frustrated with all of the different solutions. I mean, I tend to put them in, into buckets such as logs, uh, network data, threat intelligence and endpoints. And we all can get varying levels of information from all those sources. But if the three of us, John, Chris and myself had to pick one, I think that source would be the network. And if we had to look for something, I think it would be stuff that's already been compromised. And if we have even just that one reliable source that we can make decisions on, it makes your job so much easier. Um, so let's, John, Chris, I don't know if you want to kind of chime in on, on any of those points. Uh, Chris, I'll throw it over to you before I start doing the walkthrough. Yeah, the, the biggest thing for me is it's got to be easy enough for a junior analyst to do it. I, you know, I've run a couple of shops, and inevitably what you run into is you have one, maybe two guru-type folks that you can cut loose on a problem to, you know, really run it to ground. But if they can't document it and automate it and make it simple enough for a junior analyst to take it on, it isn't going to happen on a regular basis. So, I mean, that was one of the things that really excited me about this the most was that I looked at this as something that, wow, this is something you could give to the average security problem person, you know, not a Paul, not a John, not somebody who lives and breathes this, but somebody who just does it as a job. And they're going to actually be able to be effective at figuring out what's going on. Yep. All right, guys, are we ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. All Let's right. do it. Um, so I want to go over a couple of different deployment options uh, when we're talking about how this integrates with Rita and Bro. Uh, as I said, Rita is the engine. It generates the database. AI Hunter is the visualization platform. Um, you can do it all on one system, or you can do Bro and Rita on one system and AI Hunter on another system. We have an install script, and I think, Sierra, the video of the install instructions is live. Yes, it's at the, uh, I will get a link for you. Okay, very good. And I'm just going to say this, more memory is always a good idea. Uh, we're doing large-scale data analytics. Memory is your friend. So a CPU course as well. So all in one, you would install Bro, Rita, AI Hunter. Now, 
for most organizations, I would not recommend this build. Um, and the reason why is if you do it all in one, you start to get into some resources with Rita doing its analytics and AI Hunter trying to be the front end and shared, it, it can create issues. But this particular deployment works great if you're a consultant. If you're a consultant and you sniff data for 24 hours with Bro, and then you have Rita do the analytics and then you use AI Hunter, that works great for you. So if you're a consultant, you're traveling around and you're just doing this one-offs, then this particular approach would work for you. The vast majority of the approaches will look like this. It'll be pre-network address translation. We're gonna have Bro and Rita, which are free, and the install script will automatically install Bro and Rita for you on one system. And then it shovels the data once a day over to AI Hunter, which visualizes that data and makes it a lot easier for you to actually parse through it as well. So I want to show you guys uh, what it looks like right here. Um, so this is a demo system that I've been playing with. Um, so if I can move the go to webinar thing, which is currently in the way of me not being able to access my... <laughs> So it's like, get out of the way. <laughs> um, so we start out and we can click the little gears and these are the data sets that are loaded. Now, whenever Rita and uh, Bro run, they're going to kick off data sets with different, very unique names. We have names that are very specific for us to do demonstrations. So the first one I wanna do is VS Agent. I've got that selected and I can go to beacons and I wanna show you what a beacon actually looks like um, on the wire and how it's pretty easy to identify a beacon that's happening on a network. So in this situation, the first thing that should draw your attention is at the bottom. We have a whole bunch of connections that are happening over a 24 hour period. And on the bottom, we have the time. And on the left-hand side, we have the connection count. The very flat histogram is a very strong indicator of a consistent heartbeat happening in an environment. I can also change the fidelity of it from hourly to 30 minutes to 15 minutes to five minutes, and it'll basically show you that type of resolution. The other thing is over here, we have the intervals, all right? So 10 second intervals, we have almost 8,000 connections that happen at a very consistent heartbeat or an interval. There was a few that were over here at 11 seconds as we talked about that cluster pattern isn't always accurate. That's why k-means clustering is so valuable because it allows for a little bit of wiggle room. Now the chart that's in the middle is the timestamp interval. It shows you the dispersion, the skew, the duration, and the data size. The closer it gets all the way around, the more perfect that beacon in terms of dispersion or skew or duration or data size actually is. But we can also go a little bit further. Instead of just looking at it in timestamp interval, we can also flip it around and we can look at it in data size. Now when we look at it in data size, the time still shows on the bottom and the connection count shows on the bottom, but this upper right hand quadrant changes. Instead it shows you what are the number of bytes that were sent. And you can see that we have a very consistent graph here, over 8,000 connections that were made and they all had the exact same data size. So that is a very clean indication to find a, uh, to find a beacon in your network and VS Agent is a really good beacon for that. Now, I also wanna show, uh, before I do, Chris, am I missing anything on beaconing with VS Agent before I move on to DNS cat? So actually from a from a manager's perspective who wants to be able to like automate this with my team, you miss my number one, which is the IP address list on the left. That's oh, your yeah. action item list. So yep. start at the top, start working your way down. Oh, and that's that brings up another good point. Um, so this one, without question, is malware. This guy right here, this 10, 234, 234, 101, um, that's still going to my DigitalOcean system. Uh, we have one that's going to Microsoft. Now, Microsoft will look like a beacon from time to time. Uh, and let's say you just want to filter out all Microsoft traffic because updates can kind of look like beacons. Well, you can just simply hit the plus and you can whitelist out that range that CIDR range, or you can whitelist out the ASN and the organization as well. So remember I talked about filtering things out and kind of setting it up to the point where you can uh, uh, go through and this gets faster and faster each time, but the first time is kind of house cleaning. Yes, you can go through and filter out certain things that are whitelisted. So we'll, we'll see a lot of like syslog traffic leaving an environment. Uh, one of the ones that we see all every, every time are security appliances. Uh, you'll have like your, uh, your email filter, every single time your email filter is reviewing an email, it's going to do a validation on an IP address and that IP address may be evil. It's gonna be checking for updates. So you're gonna to wanna to be able to filter out those IP addresses on the inside of the network and possibly on the outside of the network. So yes, you have your action item list on the left-hand side and it makes it very easy to say, well, this is Microsoft 
and we want to whitelist this and I don't want to see it anymore because I want to focus on the systems that are uh, actual bad guys, like this DigitalOcean VS agent computer system. Cool, did I hit that right, Chris? Yeah, you did. Just uh, there's also the sort option for the list of IPs, but oh, the biggest yeah. one is, you know, which which one of which IP addresses are most likely to be evil within my environment, which is the default sort option. Just start at the top of the list, work your way down, and start sorting. So we allow you to sort on the overall score, the dispersion. Remember, I talked about that uh, bell curve, right? And we also can sort on duration and interval and data size. So all the things that we were talking about that you need to review, you can actually sort it and then relook at your IP addresses in completely different ways. And this gets into something that Paul talks about all the time. Whenever we're trying to look at artificial intelligence, right now everyone wants artificial intelligence to do their job for them. But what we can do is we can couple artificial intelligence algorithms, do good data visualization, couple that with a human being, as Chris mentioned, a junior analyst can now look at this data and to write a script that would be able to find beaconing, look at the data size, sort out all of the systems based on data size and beaconing out of bro logs for a 24 hour period. That's someone that's very, very advanced in their skill set. This is something you can put in front of an analyst and they can start using it right away. All right, so let's move on to another data set. Uh, DNS CAT is always one of our favorites. So I'll load DNS CAT. And DNS CAT, if I go to the DNS data, it's the Nanobot Ninjas example that I talked about earlier, that we have 30,000 subdomains associated with it. Now, the reason why tools like DNS CAT are really difficult to detect, I'm gonna jump over to blacklisted here real quick, is they don't use quote unquote known evil IP addresses. So in this situation, we have an IP address of 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. That's Google's DNS server, right? That's not evil in most situations. Now, we actually put it down as a blacklisted server because you shouldn't have your internal workstations connecting to Google's DNS server every day. That really just shouldn't happen. They should be going through the domain controllers through properly vetted DNS servers in order to get resolution for host names online. And in this situation, you can see that we have 1,201 unique connections and the number of bytes transferred is a lot. I don't quite know what that number is, but it's, it's a lot of data that was transferred um, in this particular scenario. So let me go back and I wanna show you the last one. I got super excited when this happened, uh, GCAT. Uh, GCAT is a backdoor that we wrote at Black Hills Information Security that uh, uses Google Mail as its command and control server. Um, so in this data set, we let it run with a whole bunch of other servers that were connecting out, or a whole, whole bunch of other systems that were connecting out. Uh, here we have Amazon. I haven't filtered out the whitelist for like Amazon and Microsoft, but it did pick up GCAT as one of the top beaconers. Now, why is this cool? And why should you care? Well, when GCAT was first written and eventually taken over by ByteBleeder, um, we discovered that almost every single security appliance on the face of the planet completely ignores anything that's going to Google. And that starts to make sense the more you think about it. Because if you're trying to look for command and control, you're looking for command line arguments. That means you're watching Google for command line arguments. That means every time a systems administrator or security professional tries to Google a command line argument, it means that an alert is going to go off. So it's best just to ignore Google. If you start watching Gmail traffic going back and forth, well, there's a lot of email traffic in organizations over Gmail, and that's going to incur a high penalty. So most organizations just flat out ignore everything that's going to Google. So we use a backdoor that does that. Now, I was really, really shocked because uh, we didn't know how AI Hunter and Rita would do with Google uh, backdoors for, for Gmail, and lo and behold, it actually worked. So here we have a connection account. We have the number of seconds. It's a very, very tight connection pattern. We have when these connections happened down here at the bottom, but notice it's not absolutely perfect. It's, it's close to perfect. It's 98.79, but it's not absolutely perfect, but it was high enough to be one of the systems in, as Chris mentioned, your action item list to look into. But if we flip it to data size, the data size is very, very consistent with the number of bytes that are being sent to Google and the number of connections that were being made. So, as I mentioned, when we first created Rita and then we created AI Hunter, the goal was to create something that could detect the backdoors that we use all the time in our penetration tests, but do it in such a way that it's not signature based in its detection. Because as Paul mentioned with the trust statement, 
at the beginning of the problem. If we put too much trust into automation, we put too much trust into that single pane of glass, well, that's chasing the magic unicorn we've been chasing for 20 years in this industry. It hasn't happened. Where instead, we can come up with a product that a junior analyst can look at data and make a determination about what's going on in an environment, whether it needs to be investigated further or not. And we think that that's a lot more powerful. So we're taking that curve, the amount of knowledge that you need to have for like scripting, data analytics, databases, and we're trying to make it so it's visualized easily. And a lot of the artificial intelligence using K-means clustering and Rita is already done. So we're moving that junior analyst up the curve where they can start hunting effectively without having to go to a class that's a week long and then spend the next two, three months learning all the stuff in that class and then spend the next year trying to get efficient at scripting. That doesn't mean that there's not value in that. There's a tremendous amount of value on that. But right now we have a skill shortage in this industry and we're trying to find good people and there's only so many people that have those amazing skills to go around this allows the more junior analysts to be effective in their job as network-based threat hunters so i wanted to say once again uh thank you so much for coming and if i go to active countermeasures i want to walk through the website can i just toss in one more thing yeah, john please. So uh, one thing I do want to point out is that as you're going through and you're looking at these systems that could potentially be beaconing, uh, not once are you mentioning source operating system. In other words, when we've got dealt with this in the past, you're usually tied to like, oh yeah, you can find it on Windows, but we don't have an agent for the Mac, or we don't have an agent for your hardware appliance or Linux or whatever. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things about going at this at a network level is this could be a Cisco router that's been compromised that's beaconing out that there's no software that would help you find it on the box itself. But by looking at the network, you know, these patterns stick out like a sore thumb. Um, I, I love that analogy of not needing to have an agent, right? Because there's all these different plugins that, you know, if you got your IOT device, well, we've got plugins for that. Well, the plugin doesn't install on this particular IOT device or that operating system. And as Paul mentioned at the beginning, network doesn't lie. Um, well, it can lie. Uh, but we can act, it, it's not like we're relying on it. On, on yeah, my the first thought system. was when Paul compromises your refrigerator, you'll be able to catch it with this. Well, that sucks because he has the same refrigerator and I'll be able to, well, okay, that's a whole, <laughs> and what we have going on. Uh, we have some questions. Yeah, we have some questions. Go ahead. Oh, so, okay, so Carrot says, where is the metadata pulling from the destination IPs? Um, so the metadata, it's interesting. What the metadata does is we take the bro logs and there is the destination IP addresses in those. But if we actually look at what bro logs look like, let me go back to our presentation. Bro logs look like this, okay? So that is where the raw source is going to come from. This is a DNS log from Bro. And you can see that we have an internal IP address uh, that's basically doing resolution. We have a 10, 234, 234, 105 is connecting out to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. That's Google's DNS server to do resolution for cat.nanobot.ninjas. So that's where the actual raw data comes from. But then we filter that out through Rita. So it'll actually do the counts. It'll actually do the analytics. It'll do the k-means clustering. And then we sync up the Rita raw output and the bro logs to AI Hunter. So we can actually query that data for you and have it up in the Mongo database with AI Hunter. Cool. Um, and Michael says, can AI Hunter be installed on a cloud system that will receive data from multiple other systems located on customer premises? Yes, it can. Absolutely. But this gets back into the sizing uh, issue. When you're having more Rita instances uh, show up and what it's going to look like is like this. So if you have multiple uh, Rita instances feeding data into an AI Hunter instance, you're actually going to see their data sets show up here as separate discrete data sets. So yes, you can actually have multiple Rita instances where you install the agent and drop it. That's data upload. If you want to install the agent on multiple Rita instances, you can. And then also the install script can handle that as well. So yes, you can do that, but make sure that your AI Hunter system actually has enough resources to handle those Rita servers submitting the data. Uh, this is the old demo server. Sierra's chewing my butt because it says okay. offensive countermeasures. Okay. So I did the demo of how to install. Okay, so I did the demo this morning. Um, it's not available right now. We had some problems with it, but we will remake it this afternoon and put it up. No, the video. No, there were some problems with it. So anyway. I had problems with the video. I got to yes, redo it all over again. Yes, you do. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Anyway, other questions. <laughs> She's moving right along. Other questions. Um, uh, sorry, I was filtering through them. Um, 
Ian asks, will this be able to link with Security Onion Bro data? Yes, you can actually take the Bro data directly out of Security Onion, sync it over to Rita. It'll do the analysis and then feed it up to AI Hunter. Um, and Tim asks, can you see the contents of the packets in the UI? No, you can't. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we went away from that. If we actually got down into raw packet contents, uh, the vast majority of times, whenever you're looking at raw packet data and backdoors, it's encrypted. Um, so there's been less and less utility in that particular vein for a long time. And as Chris mentioned, we're trying to get this in the hands of having analysts that can actually use it that they wouldn't even know what the packet data was. So we're looking at the behavioral analysis, not the raw packets looking for signatures. Um, someone clarified the demo is there. It's the installation. The installation video. I had to go check. I'm like, okay, it. my videos are still there. It's yeah. just the one that I did this morning at 3 a.m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. It was 3 a.m. So yeah. um, okay. Um, is there any reporting in AI Hunter? Right now, no. Um, and that's one of the things that Paul mentioned at the beginning. We want people to tell us what you want next. And if you want reporting, yes. Uh, we we've had a lot of conversations about how we want that to go. Uh, Chris had some good ideas about integrating with Slack. So you can basically give it a Slack uh, channel that it can just dump the information directly into so your SOC can actually work within Slack. So if you have it, let us know what you want to do. We're a very small, very agile team. We'll start moving whatever directions our customers ask us to do. Okay. Uh, Garrett wanted some clarification. So the destination IPs are coming from Bro, but where is the org, ASN, and CCR oh, range coming okay. from? Okay, that's a completely different, we're actually downloading Probably the ASN. Probably I didn't ask it right. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, that, so all that information is coming from the internet. There's a whole bunch of places online where you can download the ASNs on where they are currently, like MaxMind has it. There's tons of places where you can get the published ASN network ranges and organizations that have that data. So yes, all that's coming from like the ASN. And I think that gets updated like two, three times a week, um, ASN responsibility. So we're downloading that and then we're cross-referencing it with the data that we get from Bro and all that's happening in the background. And David um, was clarifying, so if he has Bro and Rita, does he get all this functionality? Um, but this is just a more technical aspect of so that? So Bro or? and Rita will get you this. Uh, so Bro and Rita will get you this uh, back end and kind of this basic front end that we have here, right? So this is Bro, this is Rita. Um, and this is the 504 VM that I showed you. Um, this is what you get. Now you can take that raw data and you can actually export it into an access database and you can do your own pivot views. With the AI Hunter, this front end that we have, this is what we're actually charging for. Um, the views and, and the quick ability to pull up beacons and analytics and stuff. So Rita itself, like I mentioned, will always be free, but the AI Hunter with the front end, the graphics, the visualizations, this is what we're actually charging for. Okay. Um, and okay, so then Michael has another question. Is the pricing per install or can it be bought once and installed many times? Uh, right now what it is, is you can install it uh, as many times as you want. So you can have multiple, and th let me explain why we did it that way. Okay, so Rita, like if you look at a lot of security appliance vendors that are out there, they, get, they send you a device. And if you wanna do something, you gotta install this device in a certain location. And if you wanna have multiple locations, you gotta buy multiple devices. However, what we're trying to do is more like the Snort Source Fire model, right? You have Rita is kind of the core engine and you can install that wherever you want it to go. And AI Hunter is the nice visualization that really cuts down the amount of time that you have to do on a, on a hunt. So yes, Rita will be free, installed in lots of places, and then link it up with AI Hunter that you can deploy in the cloud or you can deploy locally. Um, and David says, are there any plans to make this something that can ingest other vendor IDS models? Uh, at this point, no, because I went down that road and I had multiple developers uh, start up varying addictions to various alcoholic beverages. Um, so it's not an issue of just import Cisco. You got to Cisco, import Cisco iOS each point version, and then you got Cisco Firepower and all their versions. And then we had issues with Palo Alto, where it started logging at the beginning of a session and for half the day, and then it started logging the session time at the end of the session. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, I do know that Chris and uh, Bill Stearns are currently looking at how can we actually hook into Sims and pull different NetFlow data from other vendors that is more consistent, but that's a stepping stone, right? Right now, this is a tactical tool that your team can use, and we've got it priced as such. If you honestly look at the, at the price associated with this, it's actually cheaper than the tax you would spend on a lot of the other products that are out there right now. Um, so then there's some questions about the pricing. So I guess we'll go into those. Um, yep. 
Duran says, is the support and subscription add on an annual subscription or is it a one-time purchase? The support and subscription is an annual subscription. So you got the one-time fee of $4,999. And then as we come up with updates and people are like, yes, I want to have reporting. Great. That's now added. I want to have additional features added into it. As we start releasing each individual release, that support subscription gets you access to all of those updates for a year, for $19.99. Then on top of it, next year, we, we keep on coming up with uh, like new versions. This is what you will pay for ongoing maintenance per year. Um, and Tony has a question. Are there any license issues for data size process discipline per day? No, we tried to go down that path. And, and Paul may want to speak to this. He also may not want to speak to this because this is something that we were wrestling with. Um, a lot of vendors right now will say, OK, this is all in the cloud. If you have 19 gigs of data, we're going to charge you a bazillion dollars uh, for the product. No, uh, that was kind of a rough model to go down because of tracking and analytics, looking into people's data sets, pulling all that telemetry back in, it started making us feel really, really uncomfortable. Um, now, when you start increasing the data, the most important thing is make sure that your server can actually support it as well. And it's already hard enough for people to get hardware and things in place in their environment. We didn't want to add in some kind of weird data pricing tier on top of it as well. Um, so can I can I actually yeah, kind of stress that one too a little bit? Um, so another another part of this too for me is, you know, we're not looking to splash this out there, cash out, buy a boat, and be done. So we're not looking to kind of price gouge customers as much as we can. I mean, you know, one of the things that we've kind of talked about a lot is we have some ideas that we think we are going to make people's lives much easier in security. We want to execute on those. Sometimes it takes a little bit of money to make sure you can maintain a proper development team and a support team in order to be able to get that stuff done. So when you start looking at the pricing, you know, we, we want to be able to grow this. We want to be able to do cool things with it. We're, we're not looking to, you know, empty everybody's wallet. So, you know, stuff like charging extra for, you know, what you, oh, I want to have three Rita systems instead of just one. We're, just, we're not going to charge for that. We're just not going down that road. Cool. Um, Tim asks, does AI Hunter preserve the state of the bro logs for manual analysis? Um, it's actually loaded up into the Mongo database, so it is there, and it's not destructive. So if you want to go back to Rita and go to the system that has the bro logs, the bro logs are still there. Um, there's been a lot of comments from people that say, like, this is a totally reasonable price, and they think that maybe this is a typo because this seems too good to be true. That's right, guys. Yeah, we fought over the price for quite a while. And as Chris mentioned, look, we've got a lot we want to do. Um, and Paul will talk to this too. We want, we got a lot of places we want to go. There's a bunch more things like, look, Chris, Chris shut me down uh, at some point. I have, I have a lot more things that I wanted to do and can't do all the things. Can't do all the things. And we had to start somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is basically going to get it so it's inexpensive enough for teams to start using it, get value out of it. And then we can start funding uh, moving forward with adding in additional features because right now, uh, we've been funding this for two years now, and we need to get some funding coming in, and then we can start doing those cool things and yeah, start with a reasonable price for people to work with and keep adding in awesome features. And also, and that's that's way, you're in the security and you're good at Go programming. Um, we may be sure looking to ramp up soon. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get like 50 resumes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, right now, which is fine. Chris at activecloudcountermeasures.com. Go for it. Um, okay, so a couple more questions. David says, do you provide assistance with installing Rita and Bro as well if needed? Yeah, the user guide actually walks you through step by step exactly what you should do. And soon we'll have a video. Uh, I think I just found out what the problem was. Uh, but we'll have a video up that does full walkthroughs. It's literally downloading, unzipping a file, and then running an installer. Uh, it's a pretty easy process, all told. But yes, uh, you know, if somebody has any problems, if they can't get it with the video, they can't get it with the instruction, shoot us an email. I think it's support at activecountermeasures.com and we can assist. Um, are there any trial demo versions so that we can play with it? Um, right now, all the demos are the videos that we have right here. And also the way that we have it set up is, you know, you can basically download it and run it. And we aren't trying to tie it to any type of licensing keys or anything at all at the moment. So. You know, the best thing that I could say is Rita is free uh, as far as the back end stuff and all the stuff that we're doing there. It is absolutely free and you can use that if you want to. Um, otherwise, this is the uh, we have the demo videos, the walkthrough videos, the install instructions will be up by the close of business today. So we've got a lot of places for people to get information. 
Um, Matthew says things move slow and we might run out of time on this discount code. Are there any plans for ongoing educational institution discount? Now we, with this discount code, I think we're planning on having it up for a month, yes. right? Uh, so if you need it longer than that, I would say just contact us out of band and uh, we can definitely work something out. You know, we're, we're not a big company that's been running this stuff for years and we're like, yes, absolutely. We've got discount codes for edu, GSA ratings and all this stuff now. Um, but if you need it and you're an educational institution, nonprofit, just shoot us an email and we'll work something out. So David says, so you basically have to get Enterprise to accept Bro and Rita in order to use AI Hunter. Um, well, Bro and Rita are free. But uh, what if you have pushback from getting that approved? Uh, if you have pushback for getting that approved for those two, then basically you can bundle it on top. It's like whenever people buy security appliances, um, okay. let's say an organization says, we don't allow Linux, but then you get a security appliance and it's running Linux underneath. It's like, well, that's okay. Um, so if you're trying to get approval, just basically say, hey, this is what's running underneath the hood for AI Hunter and work it that way instead. It all depends on how you need to sell it to management. You show them a really glossy front end like this and you're like, yes, this does beaconing. It does all of these things. Um, this makes them feel warm and fuzzy. Whereas maybe bro and showing the command lines and things like this you, you makes think. them feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, whatever it takes to actually get there. But more often than not, whenever people find that there's things running underneath the hood, like TCP dump or bro or Rita, they, they don't really care what's what's in the sausage or how it's made. They want to have something that's actually functional at the end of the day. Well, usually the pushback has to do with support. You know, the, the mm -hmm. biggest concern with open source is usually I can't call somebody and get some help. Uh, whereas yeah. if bro or read is not working, um, we're going to help you because that means AI Hunter is not working either. Yes, that's a good point. Um, yep. And Tony does ask what kind of support is available for the enterprise environment. Uh, for the enterprise environment, uh, basically, <laughs> basically ongoing updates, number one. And then number two, if you guys have any issues, shoot us an email and we'll help you out. We are real people, guys. Yeah. Not <laughs> live bots. We yeah. So. And you also will get the developers. That's another thing. We don't have a help desk team of people that barely got out of college and uh, they just get started with the computer. And, you know, you, you send in a question, it's going to come directly to the development team. David yeah, and it's control. email support for now, but we'll we'll ramp that up pretty quickly. Yep. Yeah, and and we're here. Um, David says the control panel looks like a Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Managers will think you're playing games. Yeah. And it will feel like you're playing games. <laughs> well, I, and from that, you know, the front end. Uh, whenever I was pretty. using just Rita, it is so pretty. Lisa and did, Joe did a fantastic job. Uh, whenever I first started doing hunt teams with Rita and doing the analytics and kicking it out into like CSV, it would take me about a week to process through an entire hunt team for an environment. With AI Hunter, I've been doing hunt teams on this front end uh, for the past few months, and it drops it down to like a day to half a day for me to go through all of the interesting things. And that's huge for me. Um, it makes us more effective in what we do, and it also gets us to the more interesting stuff in the environment a lot so, faster. So, like normal people would, you know, take it down for a month too. <laughs> no, no, <right. laughs> okay, well, I think that we're out of time. Um, I hope we answered all of your questions. If we didn't, you can email me, Sierra at bhs.co, and I will make sure that I forward that to whoever. Um, but thank you guys for attending and staying on for the demo, and hopefully, you will try it out because it's pretty awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. You have a great day. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone.